Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at uh, a new chapter and the focus of this chapter is analyzing risk. Um, there are quantitative risk as well as qualitative risk. Um, the first thing I want to mention are more qualitative risk that are described in a company's annual report. Uh, this is actually very important. Um, Companies are required by law um, in their audited financial statement to list all important, relevant, and material risk factors. And this is located in item 1A. So be sure to uh, research that and also take a look at, at that in details. Uh, we can generally classify um, risk factors into four categories. Um, we have firm specific risk factors. Um, so this has to do with the operations of the firm. Uh, so having employees is an important part. Uh, obviously, um, depending on the nature of the business, uh, employee turnover has been a very important factor in almost all industries nowadays. Um, and then the other is is uh, ability to um, attract and retain customers as well as suppliers. Um, and in today's environment, cybersecurity is always listed as a, as a threat. Uh, so to and ascertain this, uh, whether or not uh, how how important or significant and particular risk factor is, we take that we take the firm's characteristics into account and also obviously uh, the industry. Um, something that are unique to a company uh, also potential litigation. Um, these are all things that um, you want to take into account. Um, as far as uh, industry level, um, again, you can see that these uh, have a lot of overlap between firm specific and industry um, related risk factors. Um, some of the, so what you're looking for in this case is look at the overall risk factor and then look at specific actions that a company has undertake to mitigate those to mitigate those factors as much as possible. Uh, the, the domestic economy, these are typically risks that are beyond the firm's control. And what we are looking for here is how much impact those risk factors may have on a firm. Uh, so for example, a company that is in a cyclical industry will be greater impacted by uh, a recession. Um, and a company who's um, who use a lot more leverage will be more will be impacted greater by changes in interest rate and um and in today's environment uh international risks are full uh obviously integrated with a uh, firm specific risk so if a firm rely on uh, foreign suppliers for a lot of its um input materials then changes in interest rate as well as government regulations will impact not just a firm's international operation, but as well as uh, supplies um, to the firm. Uh, most recently, we have the situation in Russia where almost overnight, you know, within a few weeks, um, a lot of U.S. companies stopped their operation in Russia. And, um, and not just that, they, the government basically um, overtook um, the firm's assets. So those risks are very real. Most of these risks are considered qualitative risk because um, very few company will assign a specific dollar amount to them. Um, there are some cases where a company may be able to to, um, to associate that. So for example, pending litigation, that's definitely a case. The other way to look at this is um, looking at what competitors have faced in the area. But most of these are qualitative risk factors. Uh, next, we can also look at quantitative risk factors that we can uh, ascertain based on the firm's financial statements. Um, we can classify this type of risk into five also major categories. Uh, the first is the short-term liquidity risk. These are quantitative uh, ratios that we look at to determine whether the, the, the short-term viability of the firm. So short-term here is less than one year. So here we're looking at a firm's ability to pay off its obligation within a one year time span. 
And then the second category are long-term solvency risk. So here we're looking at the, uh, the long-term sustainability of the firm's operation as well as is um, use of leverage. Uh, closely related to that is uh, credit risk. So um, credit risk, again, is the ability of the company to borrow additional money if needed. Um, and then, of course, the most important risk for the survival of the firm is its risk to um, uh, towards bankruptcy. And hopefully a firm is not close to that, but that's definitely an important metric that we want to be able to, um, uh, uh, to evaluate. And then finally, there are systematic risks. Systematic risks are beyond a, com a manager's control. Uh, but once again, uh, how can a firm mitigate that? Does a firm take actions to reduce their systematic risk as much as possible? We're going to use financial statement information to help us assess these five different types of risk. Let's take a look at the framework that we're going to use to analyze this. Um, in order to evaluate the risk and separate, uh, one of the key approach is to separate operating activity from financing activity. And you may remember from the statement of cash flow that we separated cash flow into operating cash flow, financing cash flow, and investing cash flow. Uh, We're going to use a similar framework here. Um, operating activities are related to a company's ability to generate cash based on its sales of goods and services. Um, you also, along with that, is working capital requirement in order to support the services and production of goods. So as far as the short-term operating activity is concerned, we, those are focused on short-term liquidity risk. Another important um, aspect of focusing on operating activity is that this type of activity and the corresponding risk and cash flow are not associated with the financing decision of the firm. Financing decision is uh, how the firm is financed, whether or not they are using uh, liabilities versus uh, equity. And then investing activity has to do with purchase and sale of um, assets. So uh, if you are expanding the, the firm, then uh, uh, plans and equipment, you'll be using cash. Uh, if you are liquidating plans and equipment, then you will be generating cash. Um, finally is your firm's financing ability and that has to do with whether or not the firm has borrowing capacity, particularly excess uh, borrowing capacity. And that um, will that will help cushion any unexpected event. Uh, if a firm is using liability heavily, then uh, the amount of money that you need to um, service is debt, which includes both interest payment as well as capital repayment, uh, will be an important will have an important impact on the firm's use of cash. Uh, together, um, both the investing and financing activity has to do with the firm's long-term solven solvency risk. And then when we are evaluating the quantitative metric, we want to also look at, well, how, how severe it is in terms of, of its impact on the firm's viability and sustainability. For example, uh, a common tactic to manage cash flow is to stretch out accounts payable. Um, that's going to... Um, that's typically not considered severe because that is a short term. Um, a firm that uh, will need to restructure its debt, um, that is a lot more severe. And then um, the defaulting on the principal payment, um, that is extremely severe. Uh, we don't want to get to the stage where a firm is filing for bankruptcy or liquidating the firm. We're going to develop methods to quantify and measure some of this risk. Now, the first thing we have to do um, before we can start computing this ratio is to reformat the balance sheet so that we can 
segregate operating activity from um, other types of activities. So here we have in a traditional um, accounting format, um, SS equals liabilities plus equity. In order to separate operational versus financial assets and liabilities, we're going to do the following. So instead of just assets and liability, uh, assets, assets equal liability plus equity, now we separate assets into operating assets versus financial assets. And obviously, these are not a gap. And therefore, there's really no principle uh, associated with or governing principle associated with uh, financial statement analysis. Financial statement analysis, I want to emphasize again, is a lot more of an art than a science. So we'll have some discretion in terms of what do we classify as operating and what do we classify as financial. We're going to focus on the overarching uh, principles. So once we rearrange asset, we also have to rearrange liability. So for liabilities, we also look at operating liabilities versus financing liability. A very important part in here is that preferred stock is considered a financing liability. The reason for that is we are looking at this as a from a um, common stock holder perspective. So even though legally preferred stock is considered equity, um, when we are doing the analysis, we include preferred stock as part of financing liability. And therefore, when we talk about equity, in this sense, we are talking about only common equity. So you'll see me uh, use the term equity throughout the rest of this chapter uh, in when, when what I meant by equity is really common equity. And we can reformulate um, this into a new arrangement to help us better understand the relationship between operating assets, um, financing obligations, and common equity. So we're going to start with our basic um, arrangement, which is assets equals liability plus equity. But now notice that instead of assets, we can have two. We can have operating asset plus financial assets. So I'm going to substitute this in here. I'm going to use some abbreviations. So operating asset plus financial asset. So I'm replacing asset here with OA, which is operating asset, and FA, which is financial asset. So we have the left-hand side, and we know that this is equal to liability plus equity. But instead of liability, I'm going to put in operating liability and financing liability. So liability will be OL, which is operating liability plus financing liability, so FL. And then lastly, we have equity. And equity, once again, is just common equity. And we can rearrange this. So we can put um, all the things that have to do with operating on one side and all the things that have to do with financing on the other side. So moving operating liability, we have operating asset minus operating liability. So that's putting all the operating uh, asset and liability on the left-hand side. And then we have financial liability minus, so when we move financial asset, that becomes negative, minus financial asset plus common equity. So now we have operating on one side and then financing on the other side. So by reformulating on the left-hand side, we define this as net operating asset, which is operating asset minus operating liability. And then on the right-hand side, we have net financing obligation, which is financial liability minus financial asset. And of course, our net operating asset so over here, is equal to our net financing obligation plus common equity. So this is how the reformulation comes from. Now let's take a look um, in more details in terms of what do we put into 
um, operating assets and operating liability. So remember, net operating asset is operating assets minus operating liability. So things that go into operating assets are mostly current assets, but we also want, to, uh, but there are other items that are less common. So cash, accounts receivable, prepaid, prepaid expenses, prepaid assets, inventory, these are your typical current assets. But anything that we use for the day-to-day -day operation of the firm are also included in there. So property, plant, and equipment, right of use of assets. So this, if you, are, you have leasehold, you're paying for a lease to use a piece of land, for example, uh, or a patent, um, all those will be part of your operating asset as well. Intangible assets, so again, that will include um, uh, patents and so forth. Another thing that may be uh, less common is deferred income tax assets. So these are uh, income tax that you, you have um, available to use, um, and then also other assets and liability. For operating liabilities, we'll include a lot of the current accounts, so that will be accounts payable, account uh, accrued liabilities, um, and other current liability. Now notice that long-term debt and current portion of long-term debt is not included in operating liabilities because those are considered financing. But we will include pension assets and liability, um, as well as deferred income tax liabilities. So deferred income tax assets will go under operating asset. Deferred income tax liability will go under operating liabilities. This is a relative uh, comprehensive list, but again, the principle is whether or not something is used for the day-to-day -day operation of the firm. Now let's take a look at financing. So to get to compute net financing obligation, we have financing liability as financing assets. So financing liability will include short-term and long-term debt. So again, um, any current current uh, portion of long-term debt will be included here as well. Excess cash. So again, this is um, cash over and above what we need for transactional um, purposes. Non-operating lease liability. So again, if it's an operating lease, that goes under um, operating liability. But if it's a non-operating lease, then you go under net financing obligation. And as we mentioned earlier, preferred equity, preferred stock is considered part of our financing liabilities. Financial assets include cash. So, um, so if this is, if you have um, um, sinking funds for your debt, then those will be considered financial assets uh, because it is related to financing, is related to debt. Um, any non-controlling in interest, so again, those are financing because they are non-controlling is not part of the day-to-day -day, um, activities. Um, sinking funds, already mentioned that, and also investment securities for financial purposes. So this is not operation. In addition to the balance sheet, we also need to reformulate the income statement for the same principles. So what we do is for each item on the income statement, we need to separate whether or not it is operating or financing. So typically, if you have a financial asset or financial liability um, that has a corresponding flow amount, so for example, interest income or interest expense, those will be considered financing flow instead of operating flow. Uh, the other thing to remember is that financing, uh, preferred stock is considered a financing uh, liability, so therefore preferred dividend and any income that is attributed to non-controlling interest is also, cons uh, also considered a financing cost. Um, what we want to generate by reformulating the income statement is net operating profit after tax, so no PAT. Um, so net operating profit after tax should contain only operating but no and no financing components. Um, obviously, these are not 
gap. So we are rearranging um, and uh, both uh, both financial statements, income statement and balance sheet, in a way that enable us to do the to do um, the analysis that will give us the information we are looking for. Uh, so you are going to see formulation of the income statements that are uh, somewhat unconventional or different from what you have seen in a typical accounting class. Uh, these are more common. You will see this formulation very commonly in finance classes. The reason why we want to do that, why do we want to separate operating from financing is to highlight the trade-off between risk and return. So some of the ratios that we're going to compute include operating ROI, and that is defined as net income net operating profit after tax, so no pet divided by net operating assets. Operating ROA has a very important characteristic, is that it is absolutely unaffected by how the firm finances capital structure. So independent of whether a firm uses debt versus equity, preferred stock versus common stock, that would not affect operating ROA. We can disaggregate operating ROA the same way we have done in uh, regular ROA. So we can uh, separate into the operating profit margin and net operating asset turnover. So what we are changing here is instead of profit margin, we have operating. And instead of just asset turnover, we have operating asset turnover. So of course, operating uh, profit margin means we are using no pet as our measure of profitability. And uh, for the turnover, we use net operating asset as our measure of assets. So again, very similar, just a different measure of profit, uh, profitability, a different measure of asset. The focus here is on operating. We also can then relate ROE, return to equity. Uh, and of course, return on equity here, we're talking about return on common equity uh, into is component. So typically ROE is net income available to common stockholders, so CS is common shareholders, uh, divided by common equity. So once again, when we when I refer to equity, I mean common equity here. Uh, we can disaggregate the same way we have seen before, the three components, uh, profit margin, turnover, and equity multiplier. So because we are working with operating, so we're going to use, um, so we have net income to common stockholders divided by sales, um, and then sales divided by total asset and total asset divided by common equity. So this is similar to what we have seen before. Um, we can also uh, replace this with um, operating components. So if we have reformulated our balance sheet and our income statement, then we can also look at ROE as a function of operating ROA, which is what we computed up here, and a different um, definition of leverage. So in the past, we defined equity, equity multiplier as a measure of leverage. Another way we can define leverage is debt to equity ratio. So D is debt, E is equity. And then um, here, the spread here represents the difference in return. I'll go into this in the next um, few lines. So debt to equity ratio is defined as net financing obligation. So this is the reformulated definition of, of liability divided by common equity. And the spread here is the difference between operating ROA and a net borrowing rate. And the way we define net borrowing rate is we take after tax net financing expenses. So remember in our reformulated income statement, we have um, all the financing income and financing expenses separated out. So those are our net financing expenses. So there'll be financing income minus financing expenses on an after tax basis and divide that by net financing obligations. So what this formulation does is it, show us, it shows us that the more leverage we use, and as long as our spread, meaning that our operating ROA, this is our return, 
net borrowing rate you can think of it as our cost as long as our return is greater than our cost then the high, the more leverage you use the higher will be your ROE return on equity so ROA operating ROA is your unleveraged meaning this does not take into account any leverage of the return that you can generate on your operating asset debt to equity ratio or financing obligation to common equity ratio this is a leverage measure so the more leverage you use provided that you have a positive spread you can increase your ROE so but of course the use of leverage increases the risk so higher the risk higher the return and if you have a negative operating ROA so if you're losing money and of course most of the time you still have to pay interest then this will greatly decrease your ROE as well so this is a magnifier so if you if your spread if you happen to your return is even if your operating ROA is positive but if it is less than your borrowing rate then use of leverage can also jeopardize your ROE so here we see that when times are good meaning when your operating ROA is high the use of leverage will magnify um, your ROE but when times are poor and your spread is negative then the use of leverage is going to reduce your ROE we're going to end the video here in the next video we're going to go over an extended example showing you how to reformulate uh, the financial statements as well as computing these ratios see you soon